All right, we'll go ahead and start and I'll introduce myself. My name is Jocelyn Batty. I am a clinical assistant faculty member at USU on the UNA Basin campus. Um, so I am colleagues with all of the other presenters from USU. I really love that we um, can use this format to bring all of our presenters together from different parts across the state to be able to put this together and be able to offer it to all of you who are participating from different parts of the state. So for as much as us all probably want to um, hate everything about COVID, this is probably one of the great things that came out of it is just everybody's willingness to participate in this format more now. Um, as you'll see on the first slide, I have uh, Jen Thornton here, but I don't actually have a co-presenter. Um, she is actually who developed the slides and the presentation, but she was unable to join us today. So I just want to make sure that she is getting credit for the work that she put into this, even though she couldn't be here today. Today, we are going to some of the takeaways that I want you to be able to get from this breakout session. We're going to talk about um, the use of self. Uh, we are our best tools when it comes to assessment and intervention. We're going to talk about some of the historical key players in crisis intervention and developing uh, the idea of crisis response. We're going to look at the stages of crisis, um, different types of crisis that can be happening, a person's response to crisis, and then we're also going to look at assessment and intervention. Um, at the end of my presentation, we have a bunch of resources and ongoing tips that if you want to come back to those, the slides will be provided. Teresa is going to send out a follow-up email to everyone, and she will have a copy of this presentation to be able to give everyone so that you'll have all of those links and book titles and web addresses. So don't worry about that. You'll definitely get them. So first and foremost, um, just our use of self when it comes to crisis work and crisis response, and really being able to know and understand our best tool, which is ourself. Um, when it comes to our work as clinicians or as social workers, how we choose to be trained and what trainings we engage in essentially is the formula for how effective we're going to be in different types of situations. And so knowing and looking internally and being insightful about ourselves will also help us to become the best tool um, to be able to respond and intervene in crisis situations. So first and foremost, one of the things that we want you to be aware of is just to reflect on your own biases about crisis situations, um, whether or not you're, whether or not you're falling prey to different types of bias that, biases that can exist, like confirmation bias or an anchoring bias. I think oftentimes this happens and we are unaware of it and we don't think that that's a possibility in the work that we're doing. Um, so in crisis response, especially with suicide, anchoring bias can be when we respond to a hospital assessment and we're looking at whether or not a client needs to be admitted. And maybe the first piece of information we receive is from the nursing staff or the doctor. And maybe we use that and that can become an anchor bias for us where that's the first information we've received. And so now we're basing all the other information we receive off of whether or not it fits with that first narrative that we were provided or not. Um, we can also have um, a blind spot bias where we think that uh, the way that we're making decisions is less flawed than the way that other people are making decisions. And that can play a part into how we provide treatment for um, crisis response. So it's important that we're aware of those of that possibility and whether or not that's affecting us so that we can be most effective in, in crisis response. We also wanna look at any experiences that we've had in crisis or even uh, lack of response uh, experiences we've had in crises moments because this can affect the way that we're responding to future experiences. And this doesn't have to be only personal experiences, whether we've um, experienced similar traumas or similar experiences. This can also be our experiences that we've had 
um, with the same community organizations in the past, or maybe experiences that we've had working with the same client in the past. And we want to be able to be aware of how those previous experiences are affecting us. Um, maybe we have an experience where, oh, whenever this ER doctor is on shift, this is how the clients get treated. Um, he's really resistive to this type of intervention, or he won't allow for, um, for this type of a hold to take place. And so maybe sometimes we walk into a situation where just because that person is working, we automatically start to change the way that we're going to approach the situation. And we just need to be conscious of that and whether or not um, we're using that in a way that's going to be most helpful or whether it's hindering our ability to respond with our best self. We also want to be aware of and confront any crisis anxiety that might exist and be aware of whether or not we're, we have the potential to be an emotional hostage. So we want to be able, crisis anxiety is when our systems are overwhelmed by a specific event. And we need to be aware of whether or not that's happening to us. And we need to be aware and confident that we can confront that in our clients that we're working with and start to help them delve into the situation um, without becoming overwhelmed with them. Um, being an emotional hostage can look like a lot of what Susan and Sean talked about. If we start to think that we're the only person who can help in this situation, or that if we fail in this situation, the outcome is going to be our responsibility or our burden to carry, then we might be falling prey to being an emotional hostage where we're allowing that guilt or shame or fear or anxiety of our performance to get in the way of doing our best work. We also want to be alert to any negative feelings that we might have toward the person. Maybe they are a client that we have provided intervention to before. Um, maybe we work for an agency that has tagged them as a frequent flyer. And so that's going to affect our feelings or maybe change the way that we approach them or our demeanor in how we approach them. So being aware of that and being able to combat that is important. Um, maybe it's feelings that we have given the circumstances of the situation where maybe we have a preconceived notion that, um, that this is just for attention. Maybe some of the information that we've received um, has given us that perception or that opinion, and that causes negative feelings as we're working with that client that, oh, this is just a waste of time. Um, I could be doing something more effective, you know, with a situation that is more serious. And we need to be very careful of moving into that territory and recognizing when we're in that territory and being able to get ourselves out. Um, again, Susan and Sean talked about that rescuer role where we always feel like we're the ones running to the problem, that we're the ones who are there to help. And we just need to be careful with that in being able to maintain healthy boundaries and kind of what they talked about. So I won't go into that one too much further. Um, as part of our role in suicide response and crisis intervention, we want to be able to convey and maintain hope for the client that we're working with or for the population we're working with. And we need to be able to face our own fears about being able to engage in crisis work. Um, maybe that might look like being able to shadow crisis response before we're the actually one, the one making the calls or being the one responsible in those situations. Um, but ultimately, if we have fears around responding to crisis and we are unknowingly or in a inadvertently conveying a message that, wow, this problem is so big and this is so overwhelming and I don't know what to do in this situation, that's going to come across to the client and, it, and has the potential to reinforce to them that their situation is too big and, and that we're incapable of helping them. So we really need to face our fears confront them, check them at the door when we're, when we know that they're there and um, do what's necessary to, uh, to expose ourselves to those situations when maybe we're not the ones um, that have the most effect and we're not the ones that are making and determining um, the outcomes of the intervention or the assessment 
and we're observing or watching and learning first to be able to confront our fears and then become the people who are responsible for making those decisions. Oh, I think I accidentally just jumped two slides. That's okay. Um, so some of the key people historically when it comes to crisis intervention, the first person ever to conceptualize a theory related to crisis was Eric Lindman. And he responded to the Coconut Grove fire um, in Boston, Massachusetts, I believe. And this was a building fire at a nightclub where just under 500 people died. And still to this day, it is the second most deadly building fire in the United States. And as he was working with the survivors and those who were hospitalized, he started to come up with a theory around crisis. Um, and ultimately his theory said that internal stability is threatened by certain changes or what he started to deem crisis in, in our social environments, which cause acute disturbance. So he started to come up with this theory of the internal stability um, specifically related to changes um, in our environment. And he was the first person to put a theory and a name behind that. A few years later, Gerald Kaplan was the first clinician to really start to describe and document different stages of crisis and crisis intervention as well. Lydia Rapoport was the first person who started to create a systematic approach to crisis interventions. How, what are we supposed to do? How are we supposed to intervene? What is most effective in that intervention? Um, soon after that, Naomi Golan was the first person to recognize a difference between um, kind of that big T trauma and complex trauma that you can have a single event that is so intense that it overwhelms the system, but that you can also have a series of less intense events, but because they're repeatedly stressful and you're repeatedly exposed to them, that it can also cause uh, the same type of response or crisis situation. And so she was the first person to start to distinguish and identify that crisis and trauma doesn't have to be a singular event or a single intense event, that it can be repetitive, stressful situations. And then uh, the last person we're gonna talk about historically, well, people, I guess, um, are Roberts and Ottens. And they were the first ones who started to develop um, an actual intervention model and assessment screeners. And they started to validate and, um, and use tools to be able to help assess and intervene when it came to crisis situation. So we want to, I want to look over and go over the stages of crisis and we're going to use this model. You can, you can find other models, but in this model, there are four stages to a crisis. And the first stage is the threat stage. And this can be something that is unknown to the person. Um, so think a natural disaster. Um, we don't always know that an earthquake is going to happen. We don't, we're not always warned if a tornado is coming. Sometimes there is warning for those types of, of crisis situations. And sometimes the warning phase is really short, right? Maybe that, that warning siren goes off or the, the warning message is received, but there's very little time to prepare and to really understand that a threat is coming. Um, in other situations, we may be completely unaware that it's happening. Um, if we're going to if lose our job, we may not have any idea that that possibility is coming. Um, on the flip side, maybe there, maybe we're starting to pick up on um, different changes in the way that our boss is talking to us or the way that coworkers are engaging with us. And so it's important to understand in this first stage where it's just the where there's a threat of a crisis. This may be a threat that's conscious, but it may also be a threat that's unconscious. The second stage is escalation. And this is where there's a sharp and sudden increase in the level of tension. This is definitely a part where the person is aware 
and they're starting to realize that that something is happening and that they need to have a response to that um, to that event or that experience. The third stage is the acute crisis. So it's the event or the experience itself. And this is where the person is trying to cope. They're trying to use coping mechanisms. Maybe they're trying to access their support system, but it's not adequate and they're failing and they're continuing to feel overwhelmed and they're continuing to experience stress. The final stage is the climax stage. And ultimately this is where the crisis resolves, the event or the experience itself is over. Um, and we start to see patterns emerge after this that we'll get into a little bit later on another slide. Uh, normatively, um, studies show that this resolving process happens in a four to six week period of time after the acute crisis. And this is something, I don't like to use this as like a standard time frame for an expectation of when people have to feel resolved or feel as if a crisis has resolved. But in my practice, I like to use this more as um, a comparison tool. If I have someone who is still very actively engaged in that crisis response or that traumatic response um, over or after that six week period of time, then that's an indicator to me of the severity of the lack of resources and coping mechanisms or the intensity of what the experience was and how much it overwhelmed them. So I like to use it more as a gauge for severity and ability to respond and where they're at, as opposed to an expectation for what should be happening or should not be happening. So there are also different types of crises that can happen. And I there's, there's about 50 of us in here. So I think that's manageable for us to have a little bit of participation. Um, what are some developmental crises that you can think of uh, that we might experience or that, that might cause a crisis for intervention? Maybe these are, are experiences where you've worked with clients in the past and you're aware of them, um, or maybe you've just done some research and you're aware, but what are some developmental crises that can exist or that can happen? Someone in the chat, oh, Susan said childbirth. Absolutely. Childbirth is something that happens in the natural course of things. And oftentimes is something you actively chose to engage in, but that is a big change and can still create a crisis. Um, someone else in the chat said puberty, um, loss of a spouse or job, loss of support people, marriage or divorce. Um, so developmental crises are essentially things that happen in the typical flow of life. Um, they can be uh, developmental in, impediments that now a person has to deal with and develop different coping mechanisms for. They can be things like moving away to college um, and now having to, to support yourself, put a roof over your head, find your own food, do your own laundry. They can be things like getting married. So these are the things, graduation from high school is in the chat. That's a great one. So these are things that, um, that it kind of life is happening. We kind of expect them to be typical things, but that the individual is still struggling to find coping mechanisms or support systems to help them effectively adjust. What about situational crises? What would we consider, what kind of situational crises have you guys worked in or worked with or responded to? Breakups, yep. And sometimes for our adolescents, that can that can be as impactful for them as a divorce in their stage of life. Any type of loss or death of a loved one, yep. Health issues, COVID and the pandemic, absolutely. Um, unfortunately, COVID is one of those situational crises that we may see um, we may see people struggling to develop 
and adjust for years to come after that. International conflicts, yeah, like what's happening in Ukraine right now, financial problems or homelessness. You guys are great. You guys are coming up with great examples. Um, if any of you are not watching the chat, I suggest you do. So situational uh, crises are, are situations that there's really no way of forecasting or controlling them. They're outside, they're events that are outside the ordinary of our typical day-to-day -day happenings. Um, and then finally, we have existential crises. And so this is more characterized by inner conflicts. What would be some, some existential crises that you guys have maybe helped others with or that you're aware of? Faith changes or faith crises. Um, Oftentimes people can hold two different values that for years have not been in conflict with one another, um, but that other things are changing that they realize those value systems are starting to come in conflict with one another, and that can create an existential crisis for an individual. Um, someone's gender, sexual identity, or sexuality, absolutely. Any other ones that you can think of? loss of identity, that's a great one. Um, and that can happen around a lot of things. And, and so sometimes we can have developmental or situational crises that happen that can also trigger more of that internal conflict that we have to deal with as well, or that we have to help our clients work with. So they are not exclusive from one another. Um, we start to see patterns emerge of how people can res how people respond to crisis. So sometimes we see people who respond in a growth pattern where the client recovers and after the crisis they've developed new skills. Maybe they have found uh, more support systems and they've relied on more support systems. And overall, they've been bolstered and strengthened by the event. We also see clients who um, show more of an equilibrium pattern, where after the crisis, they return to their pre-crisis functioning um, so that they haven't gained new skills, they haven't accessed new support systems, but they're ultimately returned to a pre-level of functioning in the same way and the same manner that they were functioning prior to the crisis happening. And then we also see people who respond in what's considered the frozen crisis pattern, and this is where we see people not returning to pre-crisis level of functioning, and they're also not developing new support or new skills to help them with the crisis. Um, in, with this type of pattern, I think we need to be aware that they might be at a place where people are suggesting that they come in for help, but that they're frozen to the point that they're not accessing they're not accessing services or intervention, or they're not willing to. So when it comes to assessment, intervention, um, and treatment models, when we're assessing, we want to look for um, kind of the immediate medical needs. We want to look at and assess for safety, both to the individual and to others. And there are multiple types of assessment that we can engage in. So first we can do triage assessing, where maybe if we're responding to a natural disaster, we're looking at where the response priority needs are, what, what needs our attention or what needs help first. And the best example for me for triage assessment comes in medical terms. If we have someone that needs help and they have um, they have a laceration on their shoulder, but they have a compound fracture on their leg, we're going to deal with the compound fracture before we deal with the scratch or the laceration, right? So we're assessing where our priority, where our energy, where our efforts need to go first. We do this in mental health care, um, but the way that we do this isn't always as structured and pre-prescribed as what it is in the physical medical realm. Um, but we do this. We look at what is affecting a client most intensely 
or what is the biggest contributing factor? And we put our energy and we prioritize intervention there before we look and provide intervention in the other areas. And it doesn't mean that we're ignoring the other areas. It just means they're going to be secondary treatment and intervention issues, or that we're not going to put as much energy. Maybe we're addressing them concurrently, but we're putting more of our priority on what the higher need is. We can also engage in crisis intervention and crisis assess or crisis assessment, not intervention, I'm sorry. Crisis assessment is when we're really focused on the here and now. We're, we're still assessing for immediate needs and for safety to self and others, but we're looking at the here and now. What are they feeling right now? What are they experiencing or what are the environmental factors that they're dealing with right in this moment? When we do trauma assessment, we start to pull in the historical factors. What are the historical contributing um, experiences or traumas that they've had that are affecting the way that they're responding or the way that they're functioning or not functioning um, right now? And then finally, we have our biopsychosocial and cultural assessment models, um, which as social workers, we're very familiar with, um, where we're looking at all of the aspects that are potentially contributing or playing a part in the individual's area and level of functioning. When we look at crisis intervention, we wanna look at and make sure that we're connecting individuals to support groups, um, that when we're responding to disaster relief, that, that we're linking people to services that may be needed or are necessary. Um, so these can be, are generally surrounded like what our basic needs are, uh, food, housing, shelter, um, water, clean water, things like that. Um, but we also do this in suicide um, intervention as well. We're looking at whether or not that person can be safe on their own and whether or not that basic need for safety can be met. And if not, what services are needed to be able to provide that level of safety? And then there's also the possibility for critical incident debriefing. So crisis intervention, we want to be implemented through strengths-based perspective so that ultimately the co their coping skills are bolstered and that we're looking at increasing the level of support systems that an individual has. Uh, finally, when it comes to traumatic stress reactions and post-traumatic stress disorders, we're gonna look into different trauma and stress management protocols we're going to ensure that we're providing a treatment plan that's trauma-informed and looks at those different areas for what's contributing to the traumatic response and the traumatic stress. And we're going to look at recovery strategies to be implemented. So one of the crisis intervention models that I like, and we're gonna look at two, um, one of the crisis intervention models that I like is the Robert's seven stages of crisis intervention. And in this intervention model, we first and foremost assess for lethality and safety needs. And then once we've established safety, we start to establish and build a rapport so that we can have effective intervention. Uh, step three is where we start to identify the major contributing factors or the major problem that the individual is dealing with. And then we respond in a connected, empathetic fashion where we're providing support and acknowledging the person's thoughts and feelings related to the situation. And then we move into exploring possible alternatives, um, helping them identify what's, what they're doing isn't currently working and helping them recognize what other possibilities exist that they can try. And we help them formulate an action plan and then ultimately we follow up and we um, re-engage with whether or not the plan was effective, whether or not they're able to use the coping skills or the supports that we've helped them identify, and we continue to kind of revisit and replan. Um, the solution-focused approach is a five-step approach to intervention, and it's really similar, and so I want you to pay attention to the things that are similar and the differences. Um, but Solution Focused says that step one is to join with the client to create that and establish that relationship to help them define the problem, 
and then set goals around that, identify possible solutions, help them develop and implement an action plan, and again, follow up and then move to termination when that's, uh, when that's appropriate or needed. And so ultimately, we have two different models, and there are a lot of other intervention models out there, but I like that you can see uh, similarities and a theme across them. We're assessing for safety, we're creating a relationship with the client, we're identifying what the problems are, helping them come up with possible solutions, implementing an action plan, and then we're following up. And when you start to see those common threads, it becomes um, easier to anchor in that intervention, in intervention with those commonalities. Another thing that we want to do when we're when we're assessing for suicide is we want to become comfortable in asking about suicidal thoughts. If we're stumbling through our words and if we're we're not doing a great job at asking the questions, it's going to become more uncomfortable and it's going to affect the level of confidence potentially that the client has in our ability to assess and help. And so we want to be able to become comfortable in asking the questions. Are you thinking about suicide? Have you had suicidal thoughts? Um, have you had past suicide attempts? Um, but we wanna be direct and we wanna be comfortable and we want it to be as comfortable in asking those types of questions as the questions that we've asked around how school is going so that it has that same level of perceived safety and containment inside of the intervention process. Um, and so we really wanna practice our techniques for listing that sensitive information. And as silly as it sounds, I think that it's important to practice whether you're finding somebody to practice with outside of an actual crisis situation, um, that can be in role-playing with colleagues or in educational situations, um, but they can always be uh, just saying the words out loud in a mirror, paying attention to what your facial expressions look like, paying attention to your nonverbal body cues, whether or not you tense up, uh, whether or not you look away when you are saying the words. And that can give you a lot of personal feedback to be able to refine your techniques that you're using to have conversations around sensitive information. Um, when we're assessing danger, we want to be able to like I said, directly ask about suicidal thoughts or past suicide attempts. We also want to ask about non-suicidal self-injury, but we also wanna make sure we are asking the questions about whether or not the client's perception is whether or not that's non-suicidal self-injury or not. Um, not just whether or not we think it is, but what their intent behind that self-injury is. Um, we want to learn about prior suicidal uh, crises. Um, there is a link here for the case approach, which is an actual training that you can sign up for. There's a level one, level two, um, that helps you to learn and understand how prior suicidal um, crises plays into and how to assess for that. There are standardized questionnaires that we can use. Um, I think one of the most common ones in use right now is the Columbia Suicide Severity uh, Scale. Um, in the last breakout session, someone identified the LRAMP, which is used in DBT. Um, are there any other assessments that you guys are using or that you're aware of that are helpful when it comes to assessing suicidality? If so, you can go ahead and drop those in the chat um, and share what resources, what other resources you're aware of. Um, so let's talk a little bit about warning signs and risk factors, because we want to make sure that as we're assessing for risk, that we're paying attention to what the risk factors are. So what are some risk factors or warning signs that you guys are aware of and that you commonly assess for? Access to guns, 
right? So access to lethal means, um, past suicide attempts, how effective their support system is, whether it's intact or whether there's a lack of support. Absolutely. What other themes? Hopelessness, recent breakups, history of trauma. Right. Um, some other things to pay attention to and to look for um, might be a history of depression or other mental illness, um, whether this is their first depressive episode or whether it's reoccurring, whether or not there's any criminal or legal um, issues happening or changes in financial status or situations. Um, we want to look at an individual's impulsiveness and their risk-taking behavior. Um, in our previous breakout, one that I really liked that came up was whether or not the person has overcome the fear of the pain of dying, which is an important risk factor. Um, some other ones that are coming up in the chat, their occupational status, physical status, if there's changes in social status, um, substance use, absolutely, whether or not they're compliant in their treatment. Um, some other factors that we want to pay attention to. So Brad asked, how would you ask that? So how would you ask about um, which part? Sorry, I want to make sure that I'm addressing the specific risk. The one, if they have overcome the fear or the pain. Um, so I have had conversations with clients about that in the past. Um, and I tend to take the same direct approach as when I am asking about suicidality. So I tend to say, um, and, and typically I'll ask this question as a follow-up to after I've asked if they have thought about a method or a plan. And I will ask them about the likelihood of them following through with that. Is there anything that's holding you back from following through with that? Which is typically where they'll come up with things like, well, I'm not sure, I'm worried it will hurt, or I'm not sure how long that will take. Um, and so then we can have that conversation about whether or not there's reservations there or whether the response is, um, well, I, I've thought about this and, and it will probably hurt, but I don't care if that's what's gonna happen. So it, it comes up in that assessment and I tend to just ask questions that just go a little bit deeper, a little bit deeper, a little bit deeper until we get to that point. And so it looks a little bit different every time with, with each client that I'm doing an assessment with, because sometimes we get there faster depending on their responses, but eventually I'm just as direct with asking that question as what I am about suicide. Um, so some other, Risk factors are things like bullying or having lost a significant relationship to suicide, um, high conflict or violent relationships, social isolation, um, historical trauma or discrimination is a risk factor. Um, And we want to assess whether or not there's there's a stigma related to or perceived stigma related to accessing uh, services or help and whether or not they're comfortable reaching out for service or help because that can also play a part into their risk. Uh, Amber said chronic pain. That's a great one um, to look for and assess for. And so is unsafe media portrayals regarding suicide. Um, so we talked about screening for lethal means, especially for firearms. So do, does a person have access? Obviously, the risk increases if a person has access to firearms because that is the most deadly form of suicide. Um, and then one of the other things we want to inquire about is internet use. And I'm curious if any of you have ideas or know why asking about internet use is important. All right, I'm going to take that as no one Sorry. wants to jump out. Oh, go ahead, Reese. 
I'll just guess, but from my own experience, I have seen folks and there's, there's some indication that uh, high levels of either screening, gaming, or internet can lead to suicide risk directly, but there's also a lot of negative, uh, like a, a lot of negative, whether you get the, the uh, negative comparisons factor out of social media. Yeah. Uh, one last thing too is I've seen more that have been it's just more common to be checking out yep. suicide methods online. So yes, absolutely. You're absolutely correct. And there's a lot of um there's a lot of good uh contributing things in the chat as well. Um there are sites on the internet that give details on how to carry out uh different methods of suicide um, or whether or not they're researching ways to die. Ultimately, the research shows that the, the higher their level of internet use is, the higher the risk for, um, for a suicide attempt is. And so we wanna ask about the frequency of their internet use and how often they're looking at the internet. And we also wanna ask about and explore what they're researching. Um, are they looking at and asking those questions specifically related to um, methods of suicide or how to access methods to suicide? Are they being bullied online? Are they looking at um, those social media feeds and it's continuing to contribute to a negative self perception? So we want to ask about and be aware of those things. The other thing that when we ask about that is easy to forget when it comes to asking about internet use is that sometimes people are going online because they're looking for resources. They're accessing helplines or hotlines. They're, they're looking for resources in their community, whether it's a support group or whether they're um, looking up different clinics or therapists to try to get in contact with. But maybe when they're doing that and they're doing that online engagement, maybe they're, it's increasing their frustration and their inability to access resources. Maybe they've called and looked up five different clinics, but they all have a wait list of three to four months. Maybe they've called different areas, but they've realized how expensive it is and financially they can't access those services. So we also wanna look at and use that information to see whether or not it's increasing their level of frustration and the hopelessness in being able to find resources to help them. Um, and then we want to ask questions about harming others and homicidal ideation. And then if possible, we want to be able to collect collateral information, possibly from um, other professionals or from family members that we may have permission to talk to, or if it's a child or adolescent that we're talking with the parents as well. So in addition to asking for and looking for risk factors, we also wanna look for and ask for protective factors. We want to look at what the person's individual reasons for living are, what's important for them. Um, and keep in mind that this is this is really individual. I've had people that, that have said, well, if I die, no one's gonna feed my cat. And personally for me, that wouldn't be the thing. <laughs> but for some people that is what is most important and that's the thing that's keeping them alive. So we want to acknowledge that, we want to address importance around that. We want to acknowledge that it's important. Um, we want to look for other protective factors as well. So their ability to cope. Um, are they using things or doing things that are effective, even if it's most of the time or some of the time? And are those healthy coping skills? And if so, let's increase their use of those. Let's help them identify maybe what's going on in the moments where it's not working to help um, to help those coping mechanisms they're already using become more helpful. I often have conversations with parents around not taking away coping skills. Um, oftentimes, especially when we're working with adolescents and kids, coping skills look like privileges. They look like playing with their friends. They look like, um, they look like, having a popsicle, which maybe isn't the most healthy thing, but it's better than some coping skills. But sometimes they look like privileges 
And inadvertently as caregivers, we have a tendency to take those things away. You're, you know, you're in this horrible mood or you're being, you're, you're being obstinate or um, um, irritable. And so I don't want you to have these things. Maybe their coping mechanism is, I realize I'm gonna explode and I'm gonna burst. And so I wanna go to my room to be able to have a moment to calm down, but maybe the caregivers are pursuers and they're like, no, you have to stay here and have this conversation with me. And so one thing that I'm constantly talking to caregivers and parents about is identifying and recognizing coping mechanisms for what they are and not taking them away, even if they look like privileges. Um, Nicole in the chat said, she had a client who wanted to stay alive for their Costco membership. Again, not my personal thing, but if that is something that's important to them, we are going to use that for all the benefit that we can get out of it, right? We're gonna help them plan trips to Costco to help bolster um, that support factor for them, absolutely. Um, we wanna pay attention to social and cultural factors. Um, this is, um, this is, this is big. Um, it's one line in a slide of 20, but this is such an important, um, area where we need to pay attention. Depending on a person's, um, ethnic background or race or age, um, that can influence the likelihood or the, that they're going to follow through with suicide or not. Um, and sometimes we wanna pay attention to subcategories as well. So a couple of examples, um, people who belong to an ethnic group that are born inside of the United States compared to people who belong to the same ethnic group but are immigrants and were born outside of the United States have a higher risk of suicidal thoughts and suicidal ideation and dying by suicide than what the, the same uh, people in the same culture if they were born outside of the United States. So we need to pay attention to, um, we need to pay attention to the cultural groups and we need to pay attention to the subgroups inside of those groups. So uh, the differences between men and women, the differences in age um, and, and be aware of how that influences uh, the possibility of suicide. So I am actually going to I actually have a list of some of these things. And when I send my slides to Teresa, I'm just going to add a slide that has some of them on there um, because some of them are very interesting and very aware. But for the sake of time to be able to get to the end of the PowerPoint, I'm going to go ahead and move on. When we assess risk level, we wanna make sure we're documenting that assessment, right? I know documentation is all our favorite thing in the whole wide world, and there's nothing else we would rather be doing with our graduate level education <laughs> than documenting what we're doing. Um, but oftentimes we get in the routine of assess for suicide, um, client denies any suicidal ideation, and we just kind of move on. But I think it's important we get more in a habit of identifying where we think they are on that continuum. Are they low risk? Are they medium risk, high risk, or are they an immediate risk? And that helps us establish more of a historical pattern as we work with an individual over time. And it helps other professionals who may at any point be a part of the treatment plan along with us to see that history and that pattern. Um, so some of the things that I think helps to identify risk is using the acronym is path warm. And so if we look at that, the I is for ideation, assessing for that first, looking at substance use, uh, purposelessness, the level of anxiety, whether they feel trapped or hopeless, whether they're withdrawing or experiencing anger, their level of recklessness and mood changes. When we start to create an intervention and treatment plan for a client, first and foremost, we need to know when and why to pursue hospitalization. And ultimately that is when safety is at risk and the person 
is a risk, an immediate risk to themselves or others, and they don't have the capacity to keep themselves safe or the others safe. Um, sometimes we look to others to help in that plan of whether or not they can um, be with them for an extended period of time and ensure a level of safety. But when an individual doesn't have that support person or their support systems believe that they're incapable of providing that level of safety, then we need to pursue hospitalization. So we need to know when and why to pursue hospitalization and also when and why not to pursue hospitalization. And um, ultimately when it comes to safety, everything trumps safety. But I've had clients who have been hospitalized and prior to being hospitalized, had never self-harmed, they had never engaged in, um, in some of those unhealthy coping skills. And by being hospital, so by being hospitalized, they became really curious what it was like to self-harm because there were so many people there who did. And they came back with a greater knowledge base of ways or methods to attempt suicide. And so there are sometimes negative repercussions um, to hospitalization, but ultimately if safety is a factor, then we need to hospitalize. Um, we want to collaboratively develop a safety plan, but stay away from uh, non-suicide contracts. Um, and then there are a few resources here for some safety plan templates. And like I said, you'll have those. Um, we have about five minutes left, so I am making sure what we want to talk about in these last couple of minutes. So after a suicide attempt, we want to bear in mind, so I love this quote that says, um, bear in mind that the person who survives a suicide attempt has escaped attempted murder. And I think that that is a great illustration um, that helps us respond more compassionately to someone who has had a suicide attempt. So we wanna make sure that we are checking for the person's reaction to having survived a suicide attempt. We wanna look at a chain analysis, what, what happened leading up to that and where could interventions be put in place to prevent that from happening again. Uh, we want to reevaluate the safety plan and look at where it fell short and bolster that so that it becomes a stronger, uh, more effective plan. And we want to address the trauma of the suicide attempt. We want to look at what the client's uh, beliefs around that were. Are they angry or sad that the plan was interrupted? Are they grateful that it wasn't? And they have discovered new reasons that why they want to live and what's important for them. And we also want to talk to our clients about a psychiatric advanced directives. Um, this is a legal document where people can um, make their treatment desires known prior to a crisis happening so that when they're in that crisis moment, there's already something in place that allows treatment to either take place or for some treatment not to occur, depending on what the client's uh, what the client's wishes are. So um, that is the end of the presentation. Like I said, there's quite a few resources at the end. Um, so there's some links for additional trainings. There are some books for professionals on um, inter crisis intervention and suicide assessment and treatment planning. Um, there are some great books. Um, memoirs from people who have attempted suicide that are fantastic. Um, there's some questionnaires and standardized tests and ultimately mental health services. And like I said, this will be available to you. So you'll have all of the links, you'll have all the titles, um, and you'll get that um, in the follow-up email from Teresa. So I think we have uh, probably just about a minute before it kicks us back out uh, to the to the whole group, does anyone have any questions or um, uh, things that they want to contribute that is an important factor to consider when it comes to crisis response? <laughs> 
All right. Well, um, on that note, you can all um, leave the breakout room early, I believe. Um, so if you click on the three dots on the right hand side where it says more and click on the breakout room options, there's an option there to leave the breakout room, but you have about 30 seconds before you're just going to be kicked out anyway. Thank you all for attending. I really appreciate that. <laughs>